Thank you so much for being with us today. What a joy it is to come into your home, your place of business, your nursing home, your hospital bed, wherever you may be watching the telecast today. I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for praying for us. You encourage our heart. We've heard from so many people. We were even in Europe and heard from some people that we met that they watched the television program in the Carolinas. And we just thank the Lord for all of you that are faithful to view. I hope you'll take time to call a friend or share with them. Tell them to set their DVD and be a part of Restore the Landmarks telecast. Will you go now with us inside as we study the word together? And let's keep rejoicing as we pray for revival in America.
child of God, and he's alive. His courage and passion is his church, and it's still alive. Lonely missionaries, so let's see with confidence. The church is still alive. Oh, saints, you're not alone and forgotten. The church is still alive. My broken-hearted friend, the church is still alive. Cynical skeptic, you have not killed God with your noisy unbelief. The church is still alive and moving. Vision of it. Keep trusting in Jesus. The church is still alive. Young Stephen, you're not alone out there serving the Lord. Just keep looking to Jesus. The church is alive. A faithful Father, there's rest in the Lord. His church is still alive. So, family of God, lift your hands. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. The church, God's church triumphant, is alive. And it's alive, my friends. Alive and well. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and soon to come. Let's go. And drawing our attention back to these verses this morning, I think it's important that we put into context exactly what's going on in the lives of these disciples and Jesus on their journey and in their ministry. At this point in his ministry, Jesus had already done many mighty and wonderful things. Uh, but even with all the proof on display that he was Messiah, he was quite unpopular, especially among the religious Jews. The Lord Jesus and his disciples were seen by many in those deeply Jewish communities as outcasts. And truly, they had been exiled from any normal social tolerance. Things were not at all easy in their earthly experience. And these disciples that are following Jesus, they had such an advantage. They had seen, they had been convinced that Jesus was God, but they were having a hard time with the plan. They were having a hard time with God's timing. And they couldn't quite get their mind around the idea that Jesus being here on earth meant that his death would come. The disciples were confused. They had a hard time processing the truth of God's plan, even in his own son Jesus. They questioned, they doubted, they feared, they misunderstood even the words of their teacher Jesus. Understand that this is not what the disciples expected. In the coming of the Messiah, these men expected spiritual revival among the Jews. These Jews expected revolution among the people and expulsion of the Romans. The burden of occupation and excessive taxation and oppression would be over. That was their expectation. It's what they thought would happen. They were looking for a military leader. They were looking for a great general and one that could lead them into battle and be successful. But that was not the plan. If you understand clearly what God assigned for these men, Jesus speaks of suffering. He speaks of picking up a cross and following him and bearing the burden and really, it's a foreshadowing of the days remaining for these disciples. It would be marked by suffering. It would be marked by pain and pressure and obedience to the call. Even after Jesus was resurrected, they still did not understand. They would ask him in Acts chapter 1, will you at this time restore the kingdom? These disciples expected to be ring wearers and robe possessors and land barons. They didn't understand. This was not their expectation. And Jesus stands there looking at his men, these unpopular social outcasts who are no doubt tired from walking all over Galilee. And he says to them, I will build my church. And at that moment, to look at the foundation, the building stones, the inception, if you will, even at what seemed within the realm of possibility, it didn't look like the church would amount to much. Social outcasts, unpopular, misunderstanding followers who are being told in one of the most wicked, vile places that existed on earth, this is where Jesus has chosen to give this message that he would build his church. The church didn't look like it was going to really be a success. But hasn't that been the church since the beginning? The early church has always had that luster of maybe failure is imminent, even in the persecution, the pressure, the warfare that the early church experienced. How many times, even after these disciples were in heaven, how many times did it seem that the end of what Christ was building was just around the corner? 
How many times did the church look like just a few more months and this faith, this talk of Jesus Christ would die out forever? So many Christians would be tortured and killed that maybe many thought if we kill enough of them, if we torture enough of them, then this faith will die out. And here we are over 2,000 years later and Jesus said, I will build my church and here we are today and in our midst, right in front of your very face, Jesus Christ is still building His church. So then what are the defining qualities? What are we to look for as God's children, as His people? What are the defining qualities of the church that Christ builds? How is it marked? What are the identifying features of the church that Christ builds? I'm going to give you four things. Number one, the church is built on, number one, a conclusive plan. A conclusive plan. This is not an accident. This is not an uh-oh. This is not a trip up and something fell into place. God said it. Jesus Christ spoke it. And it will be so. It is done. It is a conclusive plan. Plan, and you say plan. How do we know that this was something that God had pondered that He would say? There's so many scriptures to go to and look at, but even in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 18, there's a verse here that so proves the point. It's verse 18 of Hebrews 6 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Christ cannot lie. God cannot lie. And because Jesus Christ is God, when he said, I will build my church, that was the conclusive final plan. It was the only thing that needed to be said, the only thing that needed to be spoken that day. And it was simply the words of Jesus Christ. You do not get more conclusive. You do not get more definitive than the words speaking out of his mouth. It's a conclusive plan. There will be a church until the Lord says it's time for us to be in home in heaven with Him. God cannot lie. He spoke it into existence. And part of one of the greatest prayers, if not the greatest prayer ever prayed on earth in John 17, Jesus' heart is exposed before us. He spills His heart to God the Father and He reveals His desire. His conclusive plan leaks from his heart. Jesus told his Father in heaven, his Daddy, his Abba, he said, Daddy, I would that my followers, my children, my people that you gave to me, that they would be with me together. And that not only that they would be with me, but that they would be allowed to gaze into the glory and participate in your kingdom and your plan. There's nothing more great on this earth to know that God wants you to be with Him, that Jesus desires for you to be in His presence. His plan, His ministry is evangelism. His plan, His ministry is edification. It's encouragement. And the plan, the conclusive plan that Jesus set forth is to bring people to salvation, to bring people to sanctification, and one day glorification in His presence. That is the conclusive plan. It's a marker of the church that Christ builds. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the truth is, there is opposition. Listen now, there's opposition to what's even happening here today in both the physical and the spiritual realm. Opposition of human wisdom. Opposition of open rebellion. Opposition of apostasy. Opposition of error and liberalism and false religion. But friend, be reminded that because it is the conclusive plan, not of man's doing, but the conclusive plan of a three times holy God, God will speak his word and it will not be stopped. Satan can fight, Satan can war, Satan can do all that he wants to do to fight against the church, but it cannot be stopped. It is a conclusive, decisive, permanent, unchanging truth of God's kingdom that reverberates through the halls of time and eternity and into our very presence today. Jesus said, I will build my church. Final answer. And here we are today. 
and he's still building his church. Number two, the church is built on an intimate relationship. Not only is it a conclusive plan, but it is an intimate relationship. The Apostle Paul was talking to young Timothy. And Timothy was pastoring the believers in Ephesus, doing the best that he could. Acts 20, verse 28, Paul tells Timothy, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. Let me read that verse one more time for the Baptists in the room. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. Timothy, watch over them. Timothy, take care of them. Timothy, love them. Timothy, protect them. But Timothy, remember, you did not pay the price for their redemption. Timothy, you didn't save them. You didn't call them. You didn't redeem them. You can't justify them. Only God can do it. And he paid for the church with the blood of his own son. It's not some sort of relationship between God and man that's some ecclesiastical distant afterthought. It isn't just the mundane action of lighting the candle or being in attendance. It's an intimate, personal, real, tangible relationship between God and man. It's the plan for the church. John 10, 15 says, As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. The 27th verse of that same chapter. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. The church can hear even today the call of the chief shepherd. We know his voice. The voice of the shepherd tells you today that he loves you. He cares for you. And he said in his word that if you'll draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. He desires to be with you. Just like the shepherd when he picks up the tiny little stray lamb that wanders off. When we are in his arms, we can feel his warmth. We can feel his presence. If you're a sheep today, if you're in the family of God, you know when God's in the room. You can hear him comforting you in the midnight hour. You can hear his heart beating as he embraces you and tells you that it's going to be okay, that you can make it, that he's not going to leave you, that he's not going to forsake you, that yes, you've put your loved one in the ground, that it's only a temporary separation. And then the Holy Ghost, the Comforter comes and it's an intimate relationship between fractured, fallen men who had no hope save Jesus Christ paying their price on the cross. The church is built on an intimate relationship. Thirdly, the church is built on divine truth. The church is built on divine truth. Church, this is our identity. Notice this conversation between Jesus and His disciples. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, this moment was different. Peter had seen the miracles. Peter had spectated the sermons. Peter even had a head knowledge that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. If not, he would have not been following him. Peter had forsaken everything from his former life and he is following Jesus. But this was a head knowledge in this moment. The Bible says that God the Father opened Peter's eyes to the full significance of who Jesus was and revealed to him who Jesus really was. In other words, church, God opened Peter's heart to this deeper knowledge of Christ by faith. And God gave Peter the faith to believe That Jesus was the Son of God. This is the day that Peter got born again. This is the heart of regeneration. 
Peter is not merely expressing his academic opinion about the identity of Jesus Christ, but Peter is making a heartfelt confession of personal faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Him. This is every aspect of our ministry. This is the truth that we embrace. And it's what we're built on, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And our call on every life to tell the good news, to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man can come into the Father but by me. The truth of His Word. Church, if you want to know what our line in the sand is, it's in your hand today. It is the Word of God. It is the principle. It is the compass. It is what we will follow each and every single day of our lives and our ministry. It is the Word of God. It is the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. Then lastly, church, the church of Jesus Christ, the church that Christ builds, is built on invincible power. The church that Christ builds is built on invincible power. Verse 18 says, And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church that Christ builds shall never be overcome by evil. It shall never be defeated Even hell itself cannot defeat the church which Christ builds. Notice here though that Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. He did not say the darts of hell. He didn't say the swords of hell. Jesus didn't say the armies of hell. He said, no, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Gates are built to contain. Prisons have gates. Great walled cities have gates. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples is that the church that he builds cannot be contained. You cannot stop the force of the church. You can vote differently. You can put different men in power. You can make it illegal to speak the name of Jesus. You can take the Bible out of school. You can take God out of the courthouse. But no matter what hell does and how Satan fights, there is nothing, there is no gate, no power in hell that can stop the perpetual motion of the church that Christ builds. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. You can't stop the church. It's not within men's power. It's not within the Baptist denomination. It is within the power and the authority and the confidence that Christ gives His people that the gates of hell shall not prevail. You can't stop us. You can't contain us. Not because of us, but because of Him and what He spoke into our lives. Thank you for being with us today. I cannot tell you how much it means to me and to the ministry to have you for a prayer partner. Thank you so much. If you happen to be watching today, you were surfing channels and you just came across our programming, I want to let you know that our best friend, my best friend, and will be your best friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you need the Lord today, there are people standing by to pray with you. Call the 800 number on your screen. Go to our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube. All of them have ways to contact us. We have some free literature we'll mail to you about your first steps of faith as we welcome you into the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look up to heaven and say, God, be merciful unto me, sinner. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you for your prayers, your support, and don't forget to share this location, and we'll see you next time together. God bless you, it's my prayer.